Ah, Lithuania. The first country to declare independence from the Soviet Union, the largest of the Baltic states, and the only country on earth with its own national scent. While France may have the smell of freshly baked pastries, America an aroma of freshly burnt rubber, and the toxic fumes of 500 million car exhausts, and the UK the sweet, sweet perfume of tea, freshly cut grass, and sheer despair, none of them are actually official. Lithuania, by contrast, commissioned the French perfumery Gallimard to create an official scent of Lithuania, and they came up with a blend of bergamot, wild flowers, ginger, raspberry and grapefruit, with base notes of amber, cedar, sandalwood, patchouli, moss and tree smoke. You can smell it now, can't you? Well that, right there, that is Lithuania. By most metrics, Lithuania is doing pretty well. The country has enjoyed significant economic growth since the dissolution of the USSR, ranks 35th in the Human Development Index, and is a relatively stable democracy, certainly compared to neighbouring countries like Russia and Belarus. There is one area, however, where Lithuania has constantly lagged behind its peers, and that is when it comes to football. The black sheep of a continent that is obsessed with the sport, Lithuania is the only European country in which basketball reigns supreme. Football, meanwhile, has long played second or even third fiddle, suffering from a vicious cycle of disinterest and neglect with far-reaching consequences. Lithuania ranked 138th in the men's FIFA World Rankings, the lowest of any European nation of their size, below the likes of the Faroe Islands, Kosovo and Luxembourg, their league ranks 44th out of 55 in UEFA's league coefficients, again, the lowest of any country of their size, below the tiny little Faroe Islands, and the average attendance in the nation's top flight, the A-Liga, a fewer than 300, is just about the lowest anywhere in Europe. On that basis, you might not be that surprised to discover that Lithuania doesn't have a state-of-the-art purpose-built national football stadium, except that's not for the want of trying. In fact, since the mid-1980s, Lithuania has been in the process of building the Lithuania National Stadium in the nation's capital city of Vilnius, and after almost 40 years, this is what the stadium currently looks like. Admittedly, it's not quite the Tottenham Hotspur Stadium. It's not even Kenilworth Road. If we are being entirely honest, and I don't wish to put too fine of a point on things, it is just some mud with a couple of lorries and excavators driving along it. And yet, that right there, and no really, I haven't used the wrong image, has cost tens of millions of euros. 33 million euros has been spent on the project since 2008 alone, which is more than it cost to build the Stadion Miejski Widzewa and the Stadion Zagwebia Lubin in Poland, both of which have larger capacities than Lithuania's national stadium will when completed, and, uh, well, they're actually built. If you are wondering how exactly, well, you're not going to believe your luck, because that's what today's video is all about. So sit back, relax, and join me on a journey to Lithuania, as we take a look at what is surely the slowest stadium construction of all time, where the money has actually gone, and how in some ways, the story of the Lithuania National Stadium is the story not just of football in Lithuania, but of the nation's modern history as a whole. During the mid-1980s, Lithuania was still part of the Soviet Union. There was no Lithuanian national team, therefore, and no Lithuanian professional football leagues. Like Armenians, Georgians, Kazakhs, Moldovans, and Ukrainians, Lithuanian athletes and footballers represented the USSR, and professional football clubs competed within the Soviet league structure. The Lithuanian National Stadium, or Nationalisa Stadionas, wasn't initially intended to house a national team that didn't yet exist then, though pro-independence movements were gaining increased prominence at the time. But rather, it was supposed to become the new home of Lithuania's biggest football club, FK Zalgiris. Basketball has been the largest and most popular sport in Lithuania for the last hundred years, and that continued to be the case throughout the Soviet era. Although fewer than 4 million people lived in the Lithuanian Soviet Socialist Republic, compared to a population of almost 300 million in the USSR as a whole, outside of CSK in Moscow, Zhalgiris were the most successful team in the USSR Premier Basketball League, winning a total of five championships. 
During the mid-80s, they were particularly dominant, winning three successive titles, in addition to becoming the first Soviet team to reach a Euro League final in more than a decade. While basketball still ruled the roost, for reasons that we will come on to, Lithuanian sports enjoyed a golden age overall during this period, and football was no exception. Having won the Soviet First League title in 1982, FK Zhalgiris finished fifth in their first season back in the Soviet Top League, coming within four points of qualifying for the UEFA Cup. They followed that up with ninth, seventh, eighth, and eventually an all-time high third place finish in the 1987 season, which did earn them UEFA Cup qualification. Zhalgiris knocked out Swedish giants Gothenburg in Europe before falling to Red Star Belgrade the following season, in addition to finishing fifth again. In 1988, Zhalgiris players represented the USSR with distinction as Vasiklav Surustikov took silver at Euro 88, meanwhile Arminis Nabokovas and Arvidas Yanonis won gold at the 1988 Summer Olympics. The Lithuania National Stadium, therefore, first dreamt up in the early 1980s, would become the new home of FK Zhalgiris, Lithuania's burgeoning football club, and would be able to accommodate some 30,000 fans. The man tasked with designing the stadium in 1985 was Algimantes Nazvitas, a Lithuanian architect whose other works include Seamus Palace, which is the seat of the Lithuanian parliament, the Lithuanian National Drama Theatre, and the White Bridge. All, just like the new national stadium, in the nation's capital of Vilnius, and in 1987, construction began. Nasvitas, incidentally, became heavily involved in the pro-independence movement in Lithuania, officially launched by Sayudis in 1988, and it would be the success of Lithuania's independence movement, in some respects, which led to the work on Nasvitas's project being halted. On the 11th of March 1990, after candidates backed by Sayudis won the Lithuanian parliamentary elections, the Supreme Soviet of the Lithuanian SSR proclaimed the so-called Act of the Re-establishment of the State of Lithuania. In doing so, Lithuania became the first Soviet Republic to declare independence from the Soviet Union. To the surprise of most other Soviet republics, and to international onlookers alike, the USSR didn't respond, as it previously had to independence or opposition movements, by sending tanks into the country's capital. Instead, four days after the proclamation, they imposed harsh economic and political sanctions on Lithuania, which was followed by an even more severe economic blockade. Having initially sought to avoid a violent intervention, in January 1991, the Soviet armed forces stormed the LRT building and Vilnius TV Tower. The soldiers were confronted by unarmed civilians, and over two days, 14 civilians were killed, one KGB soldier was also killed in an accident of friendly fire, a further civilian died of a heart attack, and as many as 700 civilians were injured, around 140 of them believed to have been seriously hurt, in what is somewhat understatedly remembered as the January events. Slowly but surely though, Lithuania gained international recognition. First came Iceland, then Denmark, Slovenia, and Croatia. Denmark, incidentally, never technically stopped recognising Lithuania. The official Danish position was never to recognise the Soviet occupation of Lithuania, or that anything whatsoever had changed, instead merely withdrawing their embassy, and in February 1991, they reopened their embassy, again, as though nothing had ever happened. The United States refrained from recognising Lithuania, afraid of threatening the open dialogue and progress that they felt they had made with Mikhail Gorbachev, and wanting to hold off until the USSR recognised the former republic. On September 2nd, 1991, George H. W. Bush said that he could wait no longer and recognise the Baltic state. Four days later, the Soviet Union also recognised Lithuanian independence, and by the end of the month, so too had practically every nation on the planet. In 1991, when Soviet troops began seizing administrative buildings in Lithuania, and the country fought bitterly to regain its independence and self-determination, construction of the Lithuania National Stadium was halted. Yes, don't worry, I haven't forgotten about the stadium in this video, which is secretly about the modern history of Lithuania. Progress on the stadium had been slow, in light of the economic and political turmoil in Lithuania, after construction began in the late 1980s, but in 1991, it ground to a total halt. 
Although Lithuania is viewed as being one of the most successful post-Soviet states, and in fact, the most successful, along with fellow Baltic nations Latvia and Estonia by most metrics, as with all post-Soviet states, including Russia, the 1990s were tough. The Lithuania Soviet Socialist Republic, led by the Communist Party of Lithuania, was relatively successful compared to other Soviet republics. In 1990, shortly before Lithuania declared its independence and in the dying throes of the Soviet Union, Soviet Lithuania had a GDP per capita of $8,591 compared to $6,871 in the rest of the Soviet Union. The Soviet blockade, though it only lasted for 78 days, cost the Lithuanian economy an estimated 500 million rubles though, or 1.5% of the country's gross national product, and thousands of people lost their jobs. Throughout the 1990s, as Lithuania underwent radical political, economic and cultural reforms, unemployment continued to rise, there was an explosion in organised crime, and hyperinflation ravaged the economy. In 1991 alone, consumer prices rose by 225% in Lithuania, rendering everyday products unaffordable for most Lithuanians. Between 1989 and 1993, Lithuania's GDP fell by somewhere between 40 to 63%, and unemployment rose from barely 1% in 1990 to almost 18% in 1995. Unsurprisingly then, during the 1990s, completing the construction of a half-built football stadium wasn't top of Lithuania's list of priorities. Aside from anything else, FK Zhalgiris no longer competed in the Soviet Top League, but firstly the Baltic League, and then the Lithuanian A-Liga. There was now, however, a Lithuanian national team, and a deep desire to restore national pride. It's not so much that the national stadium was forgotten about, therefore, it was just temporarily shelved, and when I say temporarily, what I mean is 15 years. 15 years ago and I still feel the same. Alright, that's enough of that. In 2002, Lithuania stabilised its currency by pegging it to the euro, and in 2004, having massively increased exports with Europe following the Russian financial crisis, they joined the European Union. It was this stability, economic growth, and European integration that saw the Lithuania National Stadium project put back on the table. The government recognised the National Stadium sports complex as being an object of national importance, and announced that they would be seeking new contractors to complete the construction, 21 years after Algemantas Nasvitas, who served in the first four independent Lithuanian government cabinets as a Minister of Construction and Urban Development had designed it, and 19 years after construction had first begun. Initially, the proposed capacity of the national stadium was 30,000, but in 2000, architectural firm Viltekta were contracted by the government to update the 1985 designs, coming up with a new design with a reduced capacity of 25,000 permanent seats, with an additional 5,000 temporary seats able to be added when required. Construction work would be carried out by the government, the Vilnius State Municipality, and the municipality-owned construction firm, Vilnius Kapitalane Stapia. And so, the Lithuanian National Stadium broke ground, for a second time, almost exactly 20 years on from the first time, on February 4th, 2008, scheduled to be completed by 2009, having been assigned a 107 million euro budget for the initial phase, potentially rising to as much as 203 million euros, 58 million euros of which would be provided by central government. The plan wasn't just to build a football stadium, but rather, an entire sporting complex. That was partly because, well, again, as we will come on to, football isn't that popular in Lithuania. There has long been opposition in some quarters to spending a fortune on a solely football-centric project, and, perhaps most importantly of all, having only recently joined the EU, Lithuania and Vilnius City Council could only be granted EU funding to help finance the project if its purpose went beyond football. Within months of the work beginning, and... I literally mean two months, the global financial crisis and Great Recession threw it into doubt yet again. The financial crisis threatened to undo all of the economic progress that Lithuania had made, and the stability of the early to mid-2000s. 
suddenly, once again, spending hundreds of millions of euros on a stadium became a hot potato issue. In April 2008, Lithuania's cabinet reversed the central government's 58 million euro commitment to the stadium, announcing that it would be using those funds to increase teachers' salaries instead, and once again, work on the national stadium was halted. Construction restarted in August 2008, when the government agreed to allocate 29 million euros towards the project, but by the end of 2008, that money was gone as well, with very little to show for it, and the project was put back on hold. In 2009, things went from bad to worse. Oh, you thought that was the bad bit. Believe me, you ain't seen nothing yet. In November 2009, Lithuania's Supreme Court declared that the contract between Vikmi and Vilnaus Kapitalani Stapia, and honestly, I can really only apologise to any Lithuanians watching for my pronunciation, but they declared that their contract regarding the national stadium had been signed illegally and was therefore null and void. This kicked the national stadium back into the long grass, brace yourselves here, for another three and a half years. The lack of a suitable venue in Vilnius meant that, following independence, Lithuania's newly refounded national team played their home games at the Darius Angerinas Stadium in Kaunas, the country's second largest city. First opened in 1925, the Darius Angerinas Stadium was expanded and underwent renovations between 1969 and 1979, but it was hardly suitable as a national stadium in the 1990s and particularly into the 2000s, even for a relatively small nation and modest national team. It also made Lithuania one of only a few national teams with a permanent home stadium based outside of the nation's capital, something which was particularly unusual in Lithuania's case, given Vilnius's outsized political, cultural, and economic importance. In 2012, the Lithuanian Football Federation rectified that by relocating the national team to the newly renovated LFF Stadium in Vilnius, but it wasn't exactly an ideal solution. The LFF Stadium's previous occupants, F. Gavetra, were declared bankrupt in 2010. The stadium was renovated between 2011 and 2012, incorporating the new LFF headquarters and making the required improvements to meet UEFA Category 3 stadium status. Nonetheless, it is absolutely tiny. Even post-renovation, the stadium's capacity is barely 5,000, and following an incident in 2015 at a game against England, which was actually Harry Kane's England debut, a municipal investigation commission found that the southern stand was structurally deficient and unfit for spectators. A reminder, this was just three years after the supposed renovation. Instead of closing the stand down while further renovations were carried out, the south stand remained in use, leading to part of the floor cracking at a game against Malta in 2016, which saw three supporters injured. It won't surprise you that, from 2013 onwards, following the 2008 and 2009 setbacks, there were renewed calls then for the national stadium to be built in Vilnius, and for Lithuania to finally, at long last, have a suitable and, if nothing else, safe venue for the national team. In May 2013, the government had opted a protocol which ordered that the stadium works be urgently completed, and so naturally, work began immediately, and within just a couple of years, the stadium was completed. Nah, <laughs> I'm just kidding, of course it wasn't. The Minister of the Interior, Dalis Alfonsis Barakoskas, claimed that the national stadium could be completed by 2016, and that the government would contribute 78 million euros towards the project, but it took almost an entire year just for the government to decide that a public-private partnership would be the best solution to completing the project, and only in December 2016, when Barakoska said that the stadium could be built by, was the contract to build the stadium actually put out to tender. It took another whole year before the deadline for submitting preliminary non-binding offers expired, with Axis Industries, who had recently acquired the Vilnius-based construction company Vaikma Stapia, emerging as the leading bid. After another whole year, no really, I'm not joking, we are now in December 2019, the Vilnius City Council approved a 156 million euro construction contract. Hurrah! But that contract was blocked by the Public Procurement Office, Boo! On the basis that the government would be assuming too much risk. 
Vilnius City Municipal Council appealed the decision in court, and the appeal process, naturally, I mean really, what else do you expect at this stage, took almost a year and a half to reach a ruling. That ruling, however, was that the project could proceed. At one point during all of this, it should be said, back in 2016, the idea of scrapping the Lithuania National Stadium entirely and building a different stadium on a different site was floated, and a call for bids put out, only for challenges in the courts and a disagreement regarding an alternative funding model to see that idea also shot down. The new plans for the National Stadium, able to be completed, it is hoped, following that court approval, were drawn up by Populous. The same architects who designed the Tottenham Hotspur Stadium in London, the Park Olympique Lyonnais in Lyon, and the Sphere in Las Vegas. The Lithuania National Stadium will be on a much smaller scale and budget to any of those projects, though certainly no less anticipated, given the 40 years of wait. Scaled back once again, the new proposal is for a 15,000 all-seater stadium, which is capable of future expansion, meeting UEFA Category 4 standard, which is the highest standard that there is, and accompanied by three training pitches, an indoor arena, a separate 3,000-seat athletic stadium, a museum dedicated to Lithuanian sports, a community centre, a library, and a kindergarten. Demolition of the existing skeletal structure, now more than 30 years old, began just over two years ago and took around six months to complete. Construction of the new stadium broke ground in May 2023 after a permit was finally granted, but progress has so far been slow, and a target completion date of sometime during 2025 is already looking a little bit fanciful. It is telling that 41% of Vilnius residents said that they believe the National Stadium would never be built when polled just last month, compared to only 30% who feel that, this time, at long last, the promises will come good. A further 19% believe that the National Stadium will be built at some stage, but that it will take at least five years. Meanwhile, 10 to 11% of the 703 respondents to the survey, which was conducted by MadeInVilnius.it, either declined to respond or said that the stadium was an irrelevant issue to them. Given the potted history that I just provided, their skepticism ought to be understandable, but the issues go much deeper than that. The Lithuania National Stadium, just like Lithuanian football as a whole, has persistently been beset by allegations of corruption, embezzlement, and myriad scandals. We will start with the football. Lithuania's A-Liga isn't just one of the lowest ranked and least watched leagues in Europe, it is also widely believed to be among the most corrupt, and in some ways, the two go hand in hand. Footballers in Lithuania tend to be poorly paid, owing to the lack of interest and investment in the game, and they have relatively poor workers' rights. Non-payment of wages, for example, is a frequent occurrence which has long plagued Lithuania's beleaguered national top flight. That makes Lithuanian footballers more susceptible than most to bribes, and the evidence suggests that many of them accept such alternative forms of income, if that's not too generous a way of putting it. In 2019, 24 matches in Lithuania were suspected of having been impacted by match fixing, and that was according to Lithuania's own football federation. One fifth of footballers have admitted to either knowing or suspecting that they have participated in fixed matches in Lithuania. An enormous 38% of players surveyed alleged to have heard colleagues come under pressure to fix games, with 28% claiming to have had teammates who accepted such propositions. The end result is the undermining of trust in Lithuania's A-Liga by the tiny number of fans that remain, putting additional strains on revenue and creating a vicious cycle that has led us to this point. FK Ekranus were temporarily suspended from the league in late 2004 after being found guilty of match-fixing. Though that decision was never overturned, within 24 hours, Ekranus' suspension had been lifted, and they went on to be crowned as national champions for only the second time in 2005. Between 2008 and 2012, Ekranus proceeded to win five successive A-Liga titles, but in 2015, just three years after the last of those titles, the club filed for bankruptcy and was dissolved. A new club, FK Panjavejs, now represents the city of Panjavejs in Lithuania's top flight. 
The situation got so bad that in 2007, after finishing second in Lithuania's second tier, Efka Rodiklas Kaunas actually turned down promotion to the A-Liga, citing the costs of competing in the top flight and the existential risk that that would pose the club. In 2009, the very future of the league as a whole came under threat, when FK Kauna Jalgaris and FK Atlantis, two of Lithuania's biggest clubs, withdrew from the competition in protest with the way in which it was being governed by the Lithuanian Football Federation. A year later, FK Vetra, the former occupants of the LFF Stadium, were disbanded, and in 2020, FK Atlantis went the same way. Due to the lack of money organically generated by Lithuanian football, clubs have turned increasingly to precarious funding models and sometimes unscrupulous characters, often with disastrous consequences. The chaos and disarray of the club game is reflected in Lithuania's fortunes on the international stage. It has been over six years since Lithuania, ranked inside of the top 100 of the FIFA Men's World Rankings, over 10 years since they last ranked inside of the top 90, and they've never ranked higher than 37th, an all-time high achieved in October 2008, following impressive victories against the likes of Ukraine, Georgia, Austria, and Romania. That feels like an awfully long time ago now, though. In fact, since the start of 2021, over three years ago, Lithuania have only won three games. One in a friendly against San Marino, the lowest ranked national team in the world, and two in World Cup and Euros qualifiers, both against Bulgaria, whose extraordinary demise I covered in a fairly recent documentary. Basketball became Lithuania's most popular sport during the 1930s when Lithuanian-American basketball coaches and players helped the men's team win both of the last two Euro basketball tournaments prior to the outbreak of World War II in 1937 and 1939. Those were the dates of the last two Euro basket tournaments that Lithuania won, just to be clear. Only one constituted the year in which World War II broke out. Everyone likes a winner, and consequently, Lithuanians became besotted with basketball. It helped that, in a cold climate, basketball, unlike football, is played primarily indoors, the sport also became popular at the same time in neighbouring Latvia, and also, well, Lithuanians are quite tall. Lithuania may be a low-lying country itself, but statistically, its men are the seventh tallest in the world by nationality. That's not to say that there is no interest in football in Lithuania, or that football couldn't flourish there now. The average attendance in the A-Liga may only be a few hundred, but in the 1980s, when work first began on the national stadium, Jalgris Vilnius quite often sold out their 16,000 capacity home ground, averaging close to 12,000 fans at their peak. Likewise, Lithuania might be a little bit chilly, but now that the country is economically prosperous, there ought to be no reason why they couldn't adjust to the climate in the same way as colder but wealthier countries like Finland, Sweden, Norway, Iceland, and even the Faroe Islands have managed. The difference between Lithuania and those countries isn't so much financial anymore, though there is undoubtedly still a gap there, but political. And once again, it is a vicious cycle. In many ways, the national stadium stands, or stood, I suppose, it's just mud now, as a monument to the neglect of football in post-independence Lithuania, which has been left to rot and become riddled with corruption. That neglect is often justified by the lack of interest in football, but of course, without investment or the political will to improve the standard of Lithuanian football, you make that state of disinterest inevitable. Then there is the corruption outside of football. It is, quite frankly, an absolute joke the amount of times contracts have changed hands in regard to the national stadium, how much money has been pocketed by various parties during that time, and how little has been done. Between 2008 and the 2022 demolition alone, a reported 33 million euros was spent on national stadium-related expenses. And for what? I mean, seriously. These images, courtesy of the YouTube channel I Fly Sometimes, who kindly gave me permission to use them, which you can watch in full via his video titled Lithuania National Stadium FPV, show the state of the Lithuania National Stadium, pretty much as it stood, for over 30 years, following the initial work carried out between 1987 and 1991. Ever since, Political wranglings have consistently hampered the prospects of the National Stadium ever seeing the light of day. 
If you recall the City Council approving a 156 million euro contract from earlier on in this video, only to be blocked by the PPO for exposing the central government to quote, too much risk, that is part of an ongoing feud between central and local government, often felt to have been motivated by political and personal differences, more so than genuinely held beliefs with regard to the national stadium plans themselves. Initially, and by that I mean in 2013-14, rather than all the way back in the 80s, when it was suggested that the national stadium would have to be more than just a football stadium in order to gain EU funding, the then mayor of Vilnius, Arturas Zouakas obliged. Zouakas is a man whose Wikipedia page includes the heading Controversies with four separate subheadings, including my particular favourite which reads Divorce and Alleged Art Theft, we have all had tough breakups, give the man a break, which only narrowly takes the crown ahead of alleged street tile theft, which couldn't even be justified by a recent divorce. And another heading which reads eccentricities and has four further subheadings, including proposal to purchase a Greek island. In 2007, according to polling by Vilmaras, Lithuanians considered Zouakas to be one of the three most corrupt Lithuanian politicians of all time. Presumably that is an accolade that doesn't come with a physical trophy, but just park all of that for a moment. Zouakas gave the green light to the National Stadium's updated plans, but in 2015, he was replaced as mayor of Vilnius by Remiadja Shimashus. Shimashus then represented the Liberal Union of Lithuania, and in the 2016 Lithuanian parliamentary election, the Liberal Union of Lithuania's rivals, the Lithuanian Farmers and Greens Union, performed very well, becoming one of the dominant forces in Lithuania's parliament. Subsequently, the opposition between central and local government led to the national stadium proposals, first approved under Zouakas, being scrapped once again. The Vilnius City Council claimed that the central government killed the project for cynical political reasons, meanwhile the government claimed that the local municipality had failed to control costs and responsibly oversee the project, leaving them with no option but to intervene. If only the problems ended there, things would be so simple. Sort of. The Ministry of Education, Science and Sports and the Vilnius City Municipality signed a 25-year public-private partnership with the Bolt Cap Infrastructure Fund to manage and finance the construction of the project. Bolt Cap is the largest private equity firm in the Baltic states, in addition to having a significant footprint in Poland, Finland and Sweden. The company advertised their agreement with central and local governments as being, quote, the largest PPP agreement in the Baltics worth 280 million euros, with an estimated capex of 100 million. Shortly after that, naturally, Bolt Cap was hit with an enormous corruption scandal. Sharunas Stepakonas, one of Bolt Cap's former managers, was accused of embezzling some 16 million euros from the company, gambling much of it in two casinos. The estimate of the amount of money misappropriated by Stepakunas has since been revised up to 27 million euros, and last month, the EPPO requested his arrest. Bolt Cap, who are now both suing Stepakunas and the casino operators, who accepted his allegedly embezzled cash, claim that Stepakunas' actions didn't cause any damage to the National Stadium project. But even if that were true, purely optically, for such a historically troubled infrastructure project, the damage was tremendous. Bolt Cap has since given the project up, and it has been taken over by Lithuanian real estate developers, HANA. Much as the Bolt Cap handover may have further exacerbated what is already one of the world's greatest farces, speaking to some Lithuanians, there appears to be a lot more faith in HANA than any of the previous firms associated with the stadium, and at least some work has now begun on the new ground, which probably means Vilnius is due a plague of locusts right about now, or maybe Yellowstone supervolcano is going to finally erupt again. That's usually how these things work. Or maybe, just maybe, Lithuania will get its national stadium and a springboard upon which the nation's beleaguered footballing dreams and ambitions can finally be built. As far as most Lithuanians are concerned, they'll believe it when they see it. That is it for today's video, but thank you all very much, as ever, for watching. Bit of a different one, probably don't get many videos about Lithuanian stadiums that have taken 40 years to build on other football channels. Don't know why. 
you know, it's obvious. It's the obvious market that you should go to. Anyway, yeah, hope you enjoyed it. Hit the like button if that was the case. Let me know your thoughts down below in the comments. And of course, goes without saying, make sure that you are subscribed and have notifications turned on for both this channel, HITC7s, and also my second channel, Alfie Potts Armor, both of which should be about to appear on your screens now, along with a couple of videos that you might fancy watching after this one. You can also find me on Twitter, Instagram, or threads via the username at HITC7s on all three, and all of those links plus a whole lot more, should you be interested, should be down in the video description below. Cheers.